I've learned about human culture in the context of studying big data is the extent to which there are trends in cultural change that are completely invisible to us in our day-to-day -day lives. We wouldn't notice them or be aware of them, but they're actually completely measurable when appropriate data sets arise. And it's interesting to think that people lived through quantitative and very, very precisely describable trends, and in some sense experienced those trends without being conscious of it. And now we can actually become conscious of those trends by using these kinds of powerful data approaches to dissect them. There's all kinds of very subtle changes, for instance, in the grammar of a particular language. An example that I gave during my talk is, how do you say the past tense of a word? Do you say, Thri I thrived yesterday or I throve? Do you say, I smote him with the sword or I smited him with the sword? And those types of changes take place. They take place actually in a fairly deterministic fashion. It can take centuries for those kinds of transitions to happen. And so even though we live through them, we aren't even necessarily aware of them. When we started to look at, for instance, the frequency of words and phrases over time, I would say that in the context of our work, we interrogated tens of thousands of such trajectories. These days, hundreds of millions of people have used these tools. And for that reason, it's remarkable just all of the research journeys that have been kicked off by it. I actually had a great time over here in the taxi talking to Kevin Ashton about the engram for creativity, which he's written on in, in really fascinating ways. So he took that data and went in a direction I certainly would never have envisioned. And that's what's really exciting, actually, about these massive data sets is when you create it, there's your own ideas about what you're going to do with it. But ultimately, people will be able to take it in directions that you never anticipated. And that's kind of baked into the process, baked into the nature of these kinds of data sets. Well, I think human culture is an example, but I think it's going to be ubiquitous everywhere. I mean, biomedicine, for instance, I mean, there's this notion of patients and just people in the course of their ordinary lives are going to be surrounded by sensors that do things like measure their health. And, you know, it's the patient will say, you know, they might, you know, hey, some of the sensor value is a bit wrong. I got to go see a doctor and involve him in this healthcare process, but that actually ubiquitous biomedical sensing is going to become a day-to-day -day part. The genome revolution in biology is, of course, another example of this notion that the instructions for uh, creating any organism, such as the human, are encoded into our DNA, a massive data set, to give people a sense of things. I mean, the human genome, and that's, of course, had a transformative impact in biology. If you look at economic, you have the ability all of a sudden now to study markets comprehensively rather than I have an anecdote here, or I have an anecdote there, but you're going to simply comprehensively study every transaction that's taken place in a particular market and that is changing the nature of what the ways that we study the markets and even the nature of the ways that we interact with markets in the context of things like high frequency trading. So I think in discipline as after discipline, you can see that this notion that data can rapidly be aggregated, moved, analyzed, and acted upon is a transformative principle of our contemporary experience. question of at any given moment in time, what's the thing that you want to do? With the you know, study of human culture, we've continued to be active in that space, but we've been joined by you know, hundreds of, of millions of people who are using you know, some of the tools that we've created and some of the tools that others have created to interrogate human culture and changes in human culture. That's incredibly exciting. And you know, for me, in my mind, it also says, hey, there's other problems that are sort of waiting to be cracked open where no one's looking at it, but you could imagine massive numbers of people thinking about these data sets if the critical experimental hurdles were overcome, if, if the critical initial activation energy was put in. In the age of big data, you know, you will have people who have, are a bit nomadic, right, in that you can 
move from one discipline to another, and the unifying theme is thinking about massive data sets, thinking about how massive data sets can organize your understanding of a whole discipline rather than you know coming from you know sort of more discipline centric focus. The human genome is physically a large molecule. People don't realize that the genome that is inside every one of your cells, if it's stretched out from end to end, it's actually taller than you are. That's in a single cell, so it's fitting into the nucleus, which is only a few microns wide. Clearly it must fold up somehow. The thing that's remarkable is that we are learning that the way that the genome folds actually varies from one cell type to another. So your genome is the same in your heart cells, which beat, and your brain cells, which think, but the way that it's folded is actually very different. And so that's raised these questions of, how is the human genome folded and how does the folding facilitate the function of, of these various types of these various types of cells? What role does the folding play in health and disease? And that's what we're starting to learn from these maps. I think one of the areas that wasn't deeply appreciated prior to some of my work was the respect with which one could interrogate genome folding in practice and the insights that that might yield for the mechanisms that shape DNA and that shape patterns of gene activity and thus patterns of cell function. So I think that my work in genomics has really helped accelerate that. You know, with that said, the nature of the scientific enterprise is such that, you know, every you know, every generation builds on the work of previous generations. There were technological factors that had been developed for decades that we were able to combine in our work. And so I do want to highlight that, you know, especially when you look at something like genomics, right, it's really the integration of ideas that have developed over really a period of over a century and that have enabled us to do things like map genome folding in, in various cell types and in health and disease and understand its relationship to the kinds of clinical outcomes that we care about.